Um, I was asked by John Grisma, uh, past one field manager, to moderate tonight. My name's Howard Hunter. I don't think this group looks rowdy enough to need a moderator, generally, but I'm here just in case. <laughs> <laughs> and so, um, I, Howard Hunter, I facilitated and moderated for a long time. I'll, I'm here to do it again tonight. But this is Jerry Franklin. And Norm, where did Norm go? Norm Johnson. If you don't know who they are, they're they're reasonably famous scientists from somewhere north of here. <laughs> so with that, Jerry is going to kick it off with a little presentation followed by Norm. Questions and answers after that. Will you take questions while you're talking? Or you want to wait to the pause or you wait to the end? Yeah, we'll take them. All right. We'll come to the Small and the informal group. Now, Norm has asked me to just talk a little bit about ecological forestry because uh, that those, those terms are being bandied about a lot these days. In fact, they might even appear in legislation someday. And, and you know, over the last oh, 15 to 20 years, well, we've sort of been working a lot with traditional silvicultural approaches and modifying them to incorporate more of what we've learned about forest ecosystems and uh, things like the tension. Uh, you know, Modeling all the biological legacies that the natural disturbance is leaving behind. But obviously, you know, uh, a, a fundamentally different form of forestry can't be simply tweaking some silvicultural prescriptions. And so we're working on a textbook right now about ecological forestry. And one of the things we really had to do was to try to back off and think, you know, how fundamentally is this different from other kinds of forestry, past forestry practices, the intensive wood production oriented practices of the industry today? And so, you know, I'm just going to say just a little bit about that because ecological forestry is fundamentally a different philosophy based on a different set of premises, different set of goals, and it takes many different forms. In different, in different forest ecosystems, in different societal contexts. Okay, and so it isn't 15% retention of targets. Uh, it isn't, uh, you know, a variable density thing. Uh, it isn't 15% skips and 15% openings. It's none of those things. Those are manifestations of what it's about in particular situations with particular goals. And fundamentally, what we have in this century are two rather fundamentally different approaches to forestry. It wasn't this way uh, in traditional forestry. And I'm not going to go into them, but there were, a, there were a set of tenets of forestry uh, that really underpinned forestry in my generation of students. And in fact, through the bulk of the the century. And uh, it wasn't, it, it, it certainly had wood production as a primary objective. And, and in fact, one of the tenets was production of wood is the primary and uh, most important product of managing forests. But, uh, and it had some economic goals as well. Uh, but fundamentally, the old forester did look to the, to, the, to the forest for models to use and to try to understand how they should manage the forest. Yeah, but that's pretty much gone out the window. What we have today, you know, are a couple of different approaches. And one of them is, you know, currently what I'm going to call production forestry. And it helps to sort of think about production forestry as a counterpoint to ecological forestry. You can help define ecological forestry as much by what it is not as what it is. And basically, uh, production forestry utilizes an economic model as modified by an economic model. So today, you know, how uh, are forest lands managed by REITs and TMOs? And private companies, well, they're managed, of course, in a way to maximize.
maximize wood production and to marginalize other values to the degree that the law will allow. But it's not trying to maximize wood production. Fundamentally, that agronomic model, growing it like a crop, like we would food crops, you know, full stocking, you know, space to grow, none to waste. Uh, basically, they're not trying to maximize wood production. The goal today in production forestry is to produce a certain rate of return on capital. And it's in the context of the global capital markets. But you know, everything you have is capital, and you need a return on it. And so discounted present net value really constrains what you can do and how long you can carry the forest. But production forestry, that is what production forestry is today. An agronomic model as modified or constrained by an economic model. Ecological forestry is about something different. Basically, the model on which ecological forestry is based is to use basically natural models from forest ecosystems and managing forests for an array of values, environmental, economic, and cultural. But the guidance comes from our understanding of forest ecosystems and how they work. So these are the two fundamental contrasts today. Forestry globally has taken two very different tracks. A lot of foresters haven't realized that that's really the circumstance. So ecological forestry then basically will use natural forest ecosystems as the models that we're going to follow. Uh, there's, you can go through a series then of contracts in terms of differences between ecological forestry and production forestry that help make very clear the differences between these two approaches. Ecological forestry, you're going to try to maintain a full array of ecosystem structures, functions, and biota at a larger spatial scale. Now that's a goal, and that's certainly a goal that we have on federal land. You're going to do that. Uh, you know, the individual private forest landowner that wants to do ecological forestry you can't do all that on 60 acres or 100. 60 acres, but we're thinking if we're an owner with larger landscapes, we're going to try to do that. We're going to try to reduce risks, in effect, by increasing diversity and resilience to reduce the risks of major ecosystem disruption. We're going to tend to increase, to, to manage in such a way as to increase societal options rather than close out on. We're going to value complexity and heterogeneity because we know it works in forest ecosystems. We're going to use landscape level planning and implementation to integrate and achieve an array of ecological and other goals. So, and obviously then, that's a, a significant contrast to production forestry, which looks at maintaining a very limited set of structures, functions, and by the way, only those that are consistent with their economic goals, except where legally required to do otherwise. But their risk reducing approach is simply use short rotations. You got a problem with climate change, cut the stand, plant a new one. Purposely limits management and societal and social options in pursuit of high economic returns. And it values simplicity and homogeneity. You know, that's logical. We're focusing on efficient wood production to produce a profit. So, so those are some of the fundamental contrasts. And Norm and I are, are developing, you know, this definitional characterization and tabular comparison. It goes down through definitional elements then of ecological forestry and definitional elements of production forestry. And then gets down to the dirt, you know, in terms of things like characterizations of silvicultural prescriptions. 
So just to illustrate, one of the or definitional concepts in ecological forestry is to provide continuity between forest generations. That's what biological legacies are about. That's what retention harvesting is about. We, we like nature does most of the time, don't want to terminate a forest completely and start over completely fresh. Nature doesn't do it then. There is continuity between generations of forest and structure and function and biocomposition. On the other hand, in production forestry, there is no desire whatsoever to maintain continuity between generations of forest. You terminate a crop, you plant a new crop. You don't provide for continuity between generations. And obviously then, you can see how some of that translates into silviculture prescriptions. So, that's, you know, just generally, I, I wanted to leave you with the appreciation that this is a much larger concept than anything that we've been talking about in terms of individual practice. It's fundamentally adaptable to all forest ecosystems and essentially all societies that value their forests for multiple values. It is a far different road than production forestry as it exists in the world today. So, how does it translate into the university where you guys are? It doesn't translate well at all. <laughs> uh, universities today have a very, very difficult time in the first place because so many things are interdisciplinary. They are the interface between different disciplines. We are organized disciplinarily. So it's, it's difficult for us to deal with these things. Okay. And there's also an interesting aspect of academia. Now you might well suspect that with tenure and everything like that, that academics would be out on the cutting edge, exploring new, new horizons, you know, going where no one has gone anymore, and leading the charge for changing things. Well, the most conservative of a profession are to be found in academia. Because you can deny reality and still get paid. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so, as, as we've gone through... We have a lot more space then. As we've gone through the trauma, of, and we have been going through going a tremendous trauma in the forestry profession, forestry practice, uh, you know, who were the last adopters? Well, when I make presentations, the people I least like to have in my audience are retired academics. Okay? Uh, and again, they can deny reality. Was Weyerhaeuser going to resist the changes that occurred? No, it was not. Because a corporation lives in the real world, most people have to know the reality of what is changing, or they're going to go under. And so, uh, of course, you also get the nuts out on the other end. Who are you? Careful now.
And it doesn't mean, you know, that people are going to be purely doing one thing. Some organizations will be. And others will be doing the other thing very purely. In fact, there's an integrate between the two approaches, but they are based on fundamentally different premises. So natural models as a basis for managing forest ecosystems in the long case. An agronomic model constrained by economic. I think that's all I really needed to say. Was it? And you know, it, it's it's been difficult for us too because we started into this by twiddling with uh, traditional forestry concepts. And when you start talking about ecological forestry on a global scale, <coughs> and putting it in legislation. It better be something more than simply minor modifications of silvicultural practices. It has to have a fundamental premise. And I think we've defined what that is. So it could be a little, you're supposed to be uh, managing the forest for production, according to the OMC thing. Then how do you qualify doing, which I'm all for what you're trying to do here, but how do you qualify that? I don't think you have Mission Impossible. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you, should, you should try to retire the other one. They're tougher yet. If, in fact, you take a very extreme representation of that, if you say, in fact, the OMC Act demands that you do that, uh, you, you, you do production of income over anything else, well then, uh, there's no place for ecological forestry in that. If in fact you believe that you know that has to be constrained by other values, then you use ecological forestry. Ecological forestry doesn't ignore economics or financial return. It just doesn't optimize for that. Anytime you optimize for a single outcome, you marginalize other important values. And that's as true of our habitat as it is of timber production. So, you know, I think ultimately, you know, the resolution will be that these are federal lands and they all will be managed according to federal laws. Uh, good luck to the industry and the ONC counties and going to the Supreme Court. But I just don't expect is going to find the OMC Act overrides the Endangered Species Act. Except for one So, we'll see. So, as far as I'm concerned, there is no place for pure production forestry on the federal estate. All of our federal lands have too many other values that require that we, in fact, consider them in a and we do that effectively by incorporating natural models. How in the hell name did nature produce these incredibly diverse systems that do all these things, produce wood, sequester carbon, regulate the hydrologic cycle, provide habitat? How was that done? It was not done by optimizing for a single outcome. And that's Similarly, what we have to do with So, Barb. Thank you. Debbie, Debbie, uh, Debbie Johnson here. She is the CEO of Applegate Forestry. <laughs> and we've captured, we captured one of the domain names. And where is this case getting? And where, why would we call it Applegate Forestry? We're in, we're in Tampico, which is north of Corvallis. <laughs> what right do we have? <laughs> Heavy? Why do we call it Applegate? We call it Applegate Forestry because our house sits on the Applegate Trail. It's like right there. Oh, there you go. Yeah, I mean, literally out our window. <laughs> it does. Um, it's the Applegate Trail. Uh, I'm going to talk to you a little bit but I, about uh, how we try to apply these ideas. Um, in terms of uh, uh, in 
terms of uh, here in the Applegate. And, um, but I want to start by saying that, because Jerry brought it up, we're trying to write this book, you know, all professors are trying to write it, right? We're trying to write this book on ecological forestry, and uh, it, uh, there we go. We don't need it yet. That's okay. Why don't you leave up, you know, I'll turn the light on for a minute or two. Sorry. Sorry. Well, at least you know what the switch is on. Yeah, great. Um, and, and so, uh, we're trying to write this book, and, um, and, and I, there's a series of books in forest, it's a, it's a series, it's, this would be the fifth edition called Forest Management. Most foresters read it when they were young. I don't know, John Grisman, you read Davis. Oh yes, forest I Management. still have it. Okay, okay. <laughs> and uh, it gradually evolved, with my help, from uh, the traditional view of forest which is growth maximization to this economic model, and we're going to do a fifth edition, and we've wrestled with it for years, frankly, as to what to do. Uh, and because uh, we were kind of betwixt these two approaches. And finally, when we really realized we wanted to write a book in ecological forestry, and we have a publisher for the fifth edition, we then found, after I looked through it, that up the 800 pages of the fourth edition, I was only keeping five pages. Just for reference. And so I realized it's a new book. It's not the fifth edition. So that, it really uh, it's taken us a while to wrestle with this uh, and uh, to really get where we're going. And, and so the notion is that uh, with ecological forestry, you really ground things in the natural disturbance and development processes of forests. And that's at the heart of this. Okay, you may modify them slightly, but that's at the heart of this. Okay? And that is a very different approach than the approach that, has, that we have in production forestry now, which is really you grow a crop and you try to do it to maximize the rate of return. Um, and so, okay, and while we didn't frame it this way, when, when uh, with the help of uh, Secretary Salazar, we showed up here about three years ago try to undertake a pilot, uh, we had been working in Eastern Oregon, and we, sh and this is our, and we have worked a lot over there, especially uh, uh, now we're representing the Klamath tribes and the Fremont Wainema and uh, their old reservation. We do a lot of work there. It's a classic Congress of Pine Forest. So we show up here, and I always, I'm always the advanced guard, Jerry Franklin, uh, waits to like give him a report before he appears. Yes. There's a recent study by 
Yeah, I have. Yeah, and I've seen some of that. Yes, okay. I have. And that's that, also that is a really good study about vegetation, history of vegetation in Appalachia specifically. So that would cover that area. Yeah, it does. And that is one that doesn't quite quantify things as much as we want, but that is out now, and that's really kind of, yeah. Yeah, there's, there's also, I have a list of a couple other things. Um, the Osborne photos from the 1930s, I'm going to be looked at those, they're historic photos. Yeah, the, our difficulty is we want to go way back okay. to the 1800s. Yeah, yeah. there's not necessarily for the middle Applegate, but the John Lieber studies from right. the National Forest Resilience, the National Forest Res Reserve from 1899. And that covers a little bit of the climate issue, you know, his, like ecological conditions, vegetation conditions from 18, late, late 1800s, and it did go into the Little Alpha a little bit. So it did cover a little bit of Alpha but not necessarily the Little Alpha but it gives you an idea. Well, the trouble is, the question is, does it give you an idea? That's what we're working on. Does it give you an idea? And what we found here is, like the recent levy level, as you'll see on, up on the Squaw Lake, the one that was reported in the National Academy of Sciences. That's Squaw Lake. Yeah, that's an entirely different ecosystem. And so the, the, the difficulty of the leader estimate is the question is, does it give you an idea? Because of the incredible differences in different parts of these the climate region. And so I, you know, I, I use all of that, and I like Lieber, but the question is, how do I defend myself right here, right now? And so, uh, we, what we did is, we asked uh, for money. That's what all <laughs> people do in the universe. <laughs> we need a study. We need a study right here in the middle of the case. Did you look at donation land claim surveys, or yeah. things like that? Yes, we do. Yeah, we do. They are incredibly difficult to interpret. They're incredibly difficult to interpret. They are, and we can talk about that, but, but we did actually, uh, so we, we actually funded a study. We got money, and we funded a study. And, um, was, and of course, um, uh, Jerry and I, uh, John, provided <coughs> some funds, uh, and uh, Jerry and I will develop these ideas, but we need some grad students to go out there and roam around. And do all this. And so we found some, and here I'm going to report to you their results uh, tonight because, uh, yeah, not only because it confirms many of the ideas that Jerry had, but also because it's some really interesting. This goes all the way back to the end. Sorry. Okay, here we go. About is this uh, study that is not published yet? It will be out soon, and it's the disturbance history and ecological change. And and the reason why it says coupled human ecological system is uh, especially when we look back, we not we're not sure how much of the fire history we're going to show was lightning and how much was tribal. We don't know. There's a lot of tribal influence here, historically, right, for a very long time. And, uh, and, and the thing, one thing is that the, this, is called, uh, in, uh, uh, this is called elevational heat loading. There was a classification that they did to try to reflect within uh, the Middle Applegate and up Thompson Creek, what were the different sort of environmental conditions of the forest? And you might think of it as you go from the reds to the blues, it gets moister uh, and higher elevation. Okay? And you'll see some results from that. Well, go ahead. The, next, the first thing I want to tell you is that this is a fundamental conclusion in their abstract. Uh, it's uh, comfort, uh, comfort done, and then Jerry, myself, and uh, John Bailey. It's a fire frequency decreased significantly resulting in increased densities of spatially extended Douglas fir at expense of oak and other shade in taller tree species. The homogenation of this landscape is fundamentally different than pre-settlement forest conditions. Well, I, I, when I read that abstract, I mean, it went to says, okay, now, how are you backing that up? 
That's kind of an important conclusion, right? How are you backing that up? Go on. And here's the beginning of it. Uh, they, uh, now, Chris Pratt, where do you live? Come up here. Come up here and show me where you live. Yes, uh, halfway up. Halfway up? Yeah, go south. Yeah, right about there. Right there? Okay. On the right, you're right. Oh, so right over here? Yeah. Yeah, that's where those uh, triangles are the fire scars. Yeah, we had them from over the hill. Yeah, well, those are, these are fire scars from long ago. I mean, recording fires from long ago, but yeah, you, you have a fire history there. Remember that. And so what they did is they took these age structure plots and the uh, fire scar plots. Okay? And, um, go ahead, please. And this is a summary by their, by their, um, the different, uh, uh, their, really their different uh, elevational and, uh, and heat loading uh, classifications. This is the fires that they, they saw, starting in the 1720s. That's the oldest tree they have. And then all the way up to now. Every one of these lines is basically a fire, recorded fire. Okay? Now, what do we see here? What strikes you about this? In the middle 1800s mm -hmm. or the 1880s. Oh, yeah. 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 All the way, pretty strong, all the way back here. Whoops. And then it, it almost Whoops. stopped. Nothing. It just about stopped. It's also an increase at settlement time. Yeah, you an increase in settlement, and then it stopped. Okay? Yeah. Well, I looked at that, and I thought, well, you know, um, this does look like a frequent fire landscape. That's what we hypothesized. Right, Jerry? Yes. And in fact, it does look like that. And it's really dramatically changed after 1900. Okay, now... Did you take into account the fire burned by the miners? Well, that would be... This was whatever was recorded, so this would be some of the fire fires by the miners. That would make a lot of fire. <coughs> yeah, and, and the fire by the miners, but before that, the miners were about right here to there yeah. before that, okay? And so the point I'm trying to make is that it appears, just go back to it, Oh, I, I wanted the, yeah, it appears that, back to the conclusion. Okay, fire frequency decreased significantly. That's fundamental to their conclusions based on this survey, okay? You know, go along, went up a little bit, it just stopped. And, and that's important because there is a debate about whether this is a frequent fire landscape or whether it's a very infrequent high severity landscape. I'll get back to that. Like the one up at Squaw Lake. Okay, go on. Go on. And yes, in total, you know, the, the, the fire return interval went from fairly short to pretty long. Yeah, that's right. It did, post-1910. And so we had much less fire than we had back, as far back as we can look. We really had, despite the fact that that fire coming over your ridge. <laughs> okay. Yeah, this is the number of years, average age versus now 47. Okay? Now, next. I want to just though, talk about it because there was a study done in Upper Squaw Creek, and it's recorded in the National Academy, uh, proceeds in the National Academy of Sciences, and, um, and it showed a whole different pattern. It showed a, a high severity, long return interval. Any of you have been studying that? And uh, looking at it, and yes, it did, but this is an entirely different set of plant associations. This is what we call moist forest. And we were up there and walked around, and I thought I was in a west side of this fir forest. Right there, actually, right here on the lake, you know, where the private land is, where they cut it uh, a long time ago. That's an entirely different ecosystem up there. You can't even get a pocket. Yeah. And you can't really take that and draw conclusions about 
Thompson treatment. It just doesn't work. And so, um, because I, I, you know, I really was interested in that and wondering, you know, whether we were really haywire in our ideas. Because it's not that far away. Was the study that was done on Thompson Creek, was that specifically about tree species, or was it chaparral communities, grassland communities? What was the study focusing on? You mean this study here? The one, uh, yeah, the one on Thompson Creek, that you said you had your gra the grad students do. It was done, uh, it was mostly focused on tree species. And you will see that in a minute. But, uh, yeah, it was throughout the middle application. Yeah, but that's still, much of it was in Thompson Creek. So what we, well, one of the things I want to leave with, and I'm going to stop and take any questions before we go on, is this ecosystem is just totally different than that. We can't draw conclusions about the fire history of Thompson Creek by looking at that other study, as good as it is. And that, that we just sort of walked into. Uh, we didn't realize that, we, you know, we, we had started this before this one came out. They're, they're different worlds. And, you know, they're both valid, but they're different places. So questions or comments about that? A question about, uh, you've got about a 300-year record there, it looks yeah. like, in your, your data right. set. Is that typical? Is that uh, a normal range? you know, truncated range or, you know, pretty exceptional as far as dendrochronology? Um, um, it's, it's shorter than you might hope, you know? You know, in fact, you see, you know, it doesn't go back, you know, it'd be great to go back to the 1600s, but they couldn't find that there, Jerry. Yeah. What I was going to make, there are the older trees with the fire stuff. There just aren't many of the old trees out there. Yeah, and so it was a struggle to find them. Um, and, uh, you know, what happened is they went away and did their study and they just popped up and gave their paper to read. That's what happened. They've been down here, I think, once. And, and that was. And there, there are some of these super industrious students, and they just wandered all over. They just couldn't find older trees. Well, I wonder if it's the same to um, Dunn. I forget her first name is a woman, right? Emily. Emily Dunn? No, Emily Comfort and Krista. Krista, okay, yeah. Um, yeah, I just, I feel like there's another study that's been done, and maybe it's the same people, I'm not exactly sure, but that's why I asked about tree species versus chaparral, because they were studying chaparral in the middle of the and finding old growth chaparral communities that um, they they feel are indicative of the fact that some chaparral communities also did not burn for long enough to create old growth chaparral, and they were looking at that in historic setting too, not just current sure. settings. You know, but so and you know this graph can, you can say well this is showing that it is a high severity fire regime, but we don't we're not seeing anything to compare that to. Um, this is showing it just for middle Applegate, but uh, it's a little bit skewed because it is showing the present or the the you know the stuff that showed the 1800s around contact time, um, settlement time. So, I mean, do you have something that would show a comparison for a low severity? Or well, this no, this would we would think this is a frequent fire low severity and it's getting burned a lot often. Yes. So I'm just, saying, I'm just saying in terms of comparison sake. Like, no, we, we think we think Thompson Creek's unique in the world. That's what I've decided. <laughs> I don't mean to make light of it, but we really are done. Yeah. But it was happening here and we haven't compared it. I mean, they, they compared it to other studies, but um, it's uh, you know, they're using standard techniques. You wanna see? Well, the only thing maybe I'll say is that our initial hypothesis after we looked at skins, we looked at a bunch of skins, a dry forest skins up in Myrtle Creek, up in Roseburg area. And we looked at a bunch of skins down here in the Applegate. We looked at some over in the Grants Pass area. And the thing that we see, you know, my interpretation of these is these are maturing Douglas fir stands. These are not old stands. These are relatively young forests that are reaching you know, early maturation and with no evidence of previous older forests. How do you and explain for 
trees that are over 200 plus years that are in the area, 250 plus years. Well, you can f go into places in the landscape and you can find some older trees. And interestingly, the majority of the older trees are actually ponderosa pine. They're not Douglas. They are old Douglas. Yeah, I know they're <laughs> Douglas. There's plenty of old Douglas. I know there are, and in some of the landscapes we could find them, but you couldn't find them on the slopes. You had to go into the drops, into the drainages. I disagree with that. Because so. I've, I've hiked this area extensively, I've been to some of these areas, I know the Alpha very well. There's, and it is a very mixed, jumbled, very diverse community. I mean, that's what's so interesting about that. Um, I just, I'm just wondering how much, have you been to all these units, like, not probably not all of them, but how many units in the pile of Thompson Project have you been to? Well, I, I haven't been to a whole lot of the ones in the pile of Thompson because I was working in Pile of Joe, uh -huh. okay, so I've only been to two or three of them. And, and again, I mean, so in point. your assessment from two or three, can we take this conversation offline, perhaps after yeah. the presentation? Yeah, this is where I'm probably going to supposed to moderate here. Uh, why don't you hang on to that? Because we want them to get through, and then we want to make sure everybody gets the answer. Okay, uh, I thought question. you said he was done. Sorry. No, no, he's just started. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think you were done with your slide. Yeah. I thought you said you were done. That's okay. Uh, the, the, now, uh, next, uh, what we're going to show you is a couple, another part of their analysis, which is uh, the, the origin, the age of this, they took many plots in uh, this middle apple gate, and what was the age of the trees that they found, which has to do with their origin. Now, they use standard reconstruction techniques they measured the, you know, they, for the live trees and for the stumps, which there are a few of. They uh, use a, a, a methodology to estimate the age of the stump, and then also they looked at the records to uh, uh, harvest records to see when the harvest occurred. And out of that, they, uh, for, I asked them to summarize for all their plots. This is from the lab gate. This is the point of origin in terms of the age of the Douglas fir. Now this axis is going to become important. This goes up to 50, okay, 50 trees. This is when they were born. And you know, not many of them, there weren't many a very high density of old trees or old stumps from that period, okay. But then there was this stand that just in, once the fire ceased, an incredible initiation. Uh, regeneration. And thus, this is part of their statement that, in fact, uh, the, uh, we've seen a tremendous expanse of Douglas fir within the middle level. Now, let's look at some more, and then we'll look at a little cartoon. Uh, the next is, now, look, this looks similar, but this only goes up to 8, it doesn't go up to 50. Okay, so I wish I fixed the uh, standard. It looked much more impressive than what you're going to see. But at any rate, um, there, the grad students are out on a field trip in eastern Oregon and are unreachable. They're TAs also. So, but here, this is in the Oregon White Oak again. More initiation after, you know, here's 1850s, 1900 and on. But that's eight for eight. Okay, and then. Uh, that's true for Hector, excuse me. I'm sorry. And this is 10 for California Black Oak. Again, there's initiation after the fire stop. And um, finally, the pine. The pine again goes up to 10. So all these other than the Douglas fir, they do show some, some uh, increased uh, regeneration after 1900. It's not to the extent of the Douglas. And so now we're going to show you a little cartoon, which we went to great trouble to make this work so you're going to see it. <laughs> <laughs> this is the, it was shown a couple times. These are all the plots. Up in the left, up in the 
1660. trees per hectare. The target is the more 1830, 1850, 1900, 1970, 2000. Why don't you do it again? You've got to see it more than once. It's the only thing you have. <laughs> In terms of undergrowth versus overgrowth, what's the optimum number of trees per hectare? Uh, for what goal? For sustainability? Well, uh, we think that, we think that, I'll leave Jerry to talk about it, but we think that this indicates that in terms of sustaining these forests, we have too many trees up there right now, especially too many different species. So what would be the optimum range then? Terry, you want to see? Well, which, what size of tree and what kind of size? Let's do it again. <laughs> so there are variables, is what you're saying. There's variables. It's highly variable, depending on more productive sites will, should, can, and will carry more trees per acre than the dry sites. So basically on a lot of these dry sites, you know, larger trees, probably you need to be thinking about 25 to 35 trees per acre. So, um, you know, that, it's really kind of striking now, and they're using, some, they're using standard methodology of reconstruction, and, and we might quibble around the edges with it, but wow, well, I read that. So I looked at that. Gee, that's, that's much impressive. What do you think happened there? It's when the, well, the big, oh, he wants to see it again. <laughs> <laughs> so do it one more time. I didn't say that. <laughs> Is that swath in there where there's no plots? I assume that's just uh, big parcels of private land. Is that? You know, I I meant to ask them, and and basically what's happening here is you know there isn't too much uh, a density till right now it really begins to pick up uh, once the once uh, especially after 1900 once the fire stopped. Okay, I mean there's the lower area is public land. Yes, yeah, it is. Yeah. Yeah. 